worship this 15th Sunday after Pentecost. We are going to begin worship with singing um, Earth and All Stars. Please stand as you are able. Free us from our sins, 
Gracious God, listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. back. Um, well, today we're talking about what we're good at, or our talents. Some of us are artists, are good at painting or creating art. I'm not good at that. I can't draw a stick figure. So, if this is your talent, hopefully you share it and do it with joy. And you don't keep it hidden. But not all of us can do this. Okay? Some of us love music and we're really good at it. Our music team, really good at it. Some of you in the congregation sing really well and love to sing. Well, our family is not the Osmonds, <laughs> but we love to sing. So at birthdays, which we have a lot of, we always sing the birthday song, and we think we're pretty good. Obviously, we're not. We made our three-month-old baby cry and put her hands over her ears. Oh. And a lot of us agree. We're not that great. But we love it and we like to do it anyway. And that's the way with some of you. You may hate singing. Some people don't like singing. They don't like playing musical instruments. Other people are super good at it. And some of us do it anyway because we like it. So maybe that's not your talent. Maybe that's not what you're good at. Some of us are good at sports. I'm not. I stink at sports. I can't even play dodgeball. But a lot of you can. You're really good at it. And some in our congregation are almost semi-pro. And over the years, we've had really good teams. So there's people that are really good at it. But not all of us are. And... Some of us are really good at journaling or sending cards and letters, cheering people up. Some of us in the congregation even write novels. That's not me. I can't do that. And I really don't like sending cards and letters. I wish I did. But what I am good at is Sewing, crafting, and I really like teaching the kids to do crafts. So I think this is 
what I'm good at. The point is, there's only one person that's perfect at everything. And that's what part of the gospel is about today. Jesus was perfect. He could do everything. There wasn't anything he didn't do well. But we are not perfect. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have things we enjoy, even if we're not perfect at it. That doesn't mean that we don't have talents. Everyone has something they're really good at and they need to share and do it. And we all need to not get discouraged when we're not perfect. When maybe we screw up, we can always apologize. We can always strive to do better. And we can always turn to the one who's perfect at everything. And you all know who that is. So, with that, I'm going to tell you that the children are going to draw today. They all love it. They're all really good at it. They are going to make pictures. And so I want you to make them feel good and ask them to see their pictures after church. Because we want to encourage them to love their talents, and to love what they want to do. Okay. Okay, first reading, Isaiah 35, 4 through 7. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, Be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For water shall break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Second reading, James 2, 1 through 10, 14 through 17. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, Have a seat here, please. While to the one who is poor you say, Stand there. Or sit any, any, uh, or or have a seat here, please. Well, to the one, okay, stand here and sit my feet. Sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved sisters and brothers. Has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom? that he has promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor. It is not the rich who oppress you. It is not they who drag you into court. It is not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you. You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever 
keeps the old law but, fall, but fails in one point, has become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, the one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill. And yet you do not supply their bodily needs. What is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Word of God, word of life.
onto the door of the dishwasher. And this is amazing news because it never set, like, balanced in the dishwasher rack that you pull out. It was never balanced. And it always opened. And there wasn't enough room for plates. And now there is. And it stays closed. It is amazing the difference it makes when you learn new things. <laughs> Have any of you learned anything new lately? Last week, I learned that in the nursery rhyme, this little piggy goes to market, this little piggy stays home. The little piggy going to the market isn't going grocery shopping. <laughs> <laughs> it is sad. I don't know that I will ever count baby toes the same way again. <laughs> I, I've learned other new things recently, too, that have just opened my mind. Like, did you know that a fraction symbol, or not, yeah, the, the division symbol is actually a blank fraction with two dots where the numerator and denominator go? Yep. You knew that? I don't know that. And that the ampersand symbol you know, the little squiggly thing on your keyboard that's short for and? Well, it actually originated from a capital E and a little T, and they put it all together, all pretty. And et is Latin and French for and. So it literally is and. And you know that painting, American Gothic, with the miserable looking people and the pitchfork? And the farm behind them. It's they're not a couple. It's the farmer and his daughter. That's why she's so much younger. Speaking of farming, I learned that Orida potatoes, in name for someone named Ida. It's Oregon, Idaho potatoes, the two states they come from. I don't know that. And maybe if I was a better bowler, I would have known what maybe some of you already know, is that when you get a spare, it's called a spare because you're knocking down the rest of the pins with your spare ball. You all knew this already? Okay, well, I didn't. <laughs> if I look back, I'm how much I've learned in the past 10 years as a mother, as a pastor, as a human, there's a lot. There are quite a few things that I thought that I was certain of that I have to admit I was wrong. And there are certain perceptions and ideals I held that now I have a very different perspective on. My mind has been open. In Bible study lately, we've been talking about the exile. And I have to tell you that even though I grew up going to Sunday school all the time, I was the nerd in class, raise my hand, to answer all the questions. And in high school, I went to Bible study every week. It wasn't until my Religion 101 class in college that I learned that the exodus and the exile were two very different events, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years apart. And as you look around, we're reminded that in this time after Pentecost, the color is green because this is a time of growth and learning. It is a very human thing to grow and to learn. And Jesus was fully human. He was also fully divine. But in his humanity, he learned. And he wasn't born in Bethlehem 
knowing everything already. That would be a ridiculous version of Boss Baby. Can you imagine? Just like every other human, Jesus had to learn to crawl and to walk and to talk and to potty train and to read. His parents taught him how to share and right from wrong and how the world works. And at some point, he learned to understand his own identity as a beloved child, as son of God. Now, Jesus needing to learn things doesn't make him any less perfect. In some ways, it makes him more perfectly human. And like most of us humans, there were probably times when he didn't especially want to learn or to be coached or to grow. We all have those days, don't we? Like that time when he was at the wedding in Cana and they ran out of wine and his mother had to pull him by the ear or slap him upside the head and teach him that it was time to live into his identity, to do what he needed to do. And Jesus learned. And he got busy turning all that water into wine, didn't he? Well, in Mark's Gospel today, we learn about another time when another mother taught Jesus, and he learned. You see, Jesus grew up hearing very similar stereotypes to what we hear today. Have you noticed that in every state, people talk about how the drivers in the neighboring states are awful. I think here in California, I hear about oh, those Nevada drivers. When I lived in Illinois, it was those Wisconsin drivers. We do that, don't we? And, and most people in countries seem to have an issue where we want to believe that those in border countries aren't quite as good as us, or worthy, or deserving. It's just ingrained in us. And Jesus grew up hearing the same sorts of things, and he probably learned some of those same prejudices because we aren't born with and so, when one day he was tired and just wanted to be left alone, and maybe a little cranky, and this Syrophoenician Gentile, this woman from Syria who was a different religion, came and asked him to heal her daughter. Jesus responded the way he had been taught. And he called her a dog. Now the amazing thing is that this woman had courage. And just as Jesus' own mother had taught him, this woman taught Jesus. And he was able to learn something new. 
She forced Jesus to see her, to listen to her, and to think about his prejudices. And Jesus was open. And as he did so, he realized what deep down he knew all along. This woman wasn't a dog. She was a beloved child of God. And in being open to listening and learning this truth, this reality, Jesus also learned the truth of his own reality his own identity, that he had not only been sent to the Jewish people, he had been sent to all people. Jesus was opened. He listened. He learned. He grew. And he changed. And he carried that with him as he went on to bring healing to this man who couldn't hear and couldn't speak. When he told this man to be open, he was telling this man to listen. Not just for that day, to, but to listen and see people, to be open, to learn, to grow, to change. And this isn't just a lesson that Jesus taught for this one man one day a couple thousand years ago. This is what Jesus teaches to us today, calling us to put aside our stereotypes, to get rid of our prejudices, to put an end to our isms, our phobias, that which would separate us from one another, and to be open so that we can be united as the body of Christ that we have been created to be. This is how Jesus brings healing to us. This is how we bring healing into the world. This isn't just a lesson that we're learning today that we learn in the sanctuary and almost as you're saying, great pastor, or great sermon pastor, as you're walking out the doors, then you forget it. And you forget it when you get on social media, and you forget it when you start talking to that friend who is frustrated and angry and doesn't like all the same people you don't like. This is a new way of living. It's people who are learning. Because it doesn't matter how cranky or frustrated we are or how tired we are with the world. It doesn't matter how many books we've read or how many experiences we've had or how many years we have just been the way we are. Because God's not done with any of us yet. None of us are too old to learn. There is a lot we don't know. And there are a lot of neighbors. We still need to learn how to love. The way that God loves them. The way that God loves us. So today, I hear Jesus calling to us to be open, to listen, to learn, 
to grow and to change. To be more like Jesus. Because that's not something we can unlearn. Amen. I invite you all to stand as you are able for the hymn of the day. Lord, in your mercy. 
Hear our prayer. You support the work of your disciples. Continue to nurture their leadership and ministries of this congregation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Today we especially lift up to you, Evelyn, Laura, Lena, Alex, Tegan, Ron, and Jasmine, and the loved ones of Clyde Wren. We also lift up to you all who are displaced from the fires, hurricanes, and the first responders. We grieve with all who mourn the deaths of our 13 Marines and the 90 civilians who were killed in Kabul airport attack last week, and lift up the people of Afghanistan during this time of chaos. Please bring wisdom, guidance, and discernment to all our world leaders to help bring peace. We now lift up to you those we name before you now. You embrace all who have died in the faith and brought them into your glorious presence. We thank you for their example and rejoice in their lives. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts know only to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us take some time to share the peace with one another. If you have a full noodle near you, you can use that to socially distance. <laughs> Everybody share the peace with our friends at home. Peace be with you. Peace be with you.
out of abundance, you cause streams to break forth in the desert, and the manna to rain from the heavens. Accept the gifts you have first given us. Unite them with the offering of our lives to nourish the world you love so dearly. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. God, our maker, redeemer, and healer, in the harmonious world of your creation, the plants and animals, the seas and stars were whole and well in your praise. When sin had scarred the world, you sent your Son to heal our ills and to form us again into one. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his acts of healing, his body given up, and his victory over death, we await that day when all the peoples of the earth will come to the river to enjoy the tree of life. Send your spirit upon us in this meal. As grain scattered on the hillside become one bread, so let your church be gathered from the ends of the earth, that all may be fed with the bread of life, your Son. Through him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins and we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power,